A friend of mine just picked up a brand new 77 inch LG CX series OLED TV. So of course I wanted to try it out. Let's lag test this thing. Plus see how it works with the OSSC. Before we begin, I just want to let everybody know that if you are looking for a more in-depth review, maybe something that compares this TV to others, as well as different places to get the exact tweaks and settings that you'll need in order to really calibrate this thing, I strongly recommend starting out with checking out Digital Foundry's videos. They did one a few months ago about the best TVs of 2020, and I believe this one, or at least the LG OLED series, was on the list, and it certainly was a big factor in many of my friends purchasing their TVs as well as check out the website artings.com as they list lag test results, as well as specific settings for each TV that they recommend to get the best performance out of it. Also, I'd like to give a big shout out to my friends Destiny and Joey for letting me come over and take over their entire apartment to do these tests. Uh, if it were me on the first day that I got my new TV, I wouldn't want anybody near me. I would just want to be testing it by myself, but they were nice enough to let me come over and have at it. So thanks very much to them. And let's jump right in and start lag testing. All right, so we got this thing powered up and the very first thing I wanted to do is show the time sleuth and test lag for a bunch of different reasons. So I'll just first take the reading and it's at 84 milliseconds, but this is not in game mode yet. I wanted to demonstrate this so we could go through and see how much each setting determines the lag. And on all of these TVs, they're in slightly different places. So I'll just start out game mode immediately drops to 9.3 milliseconds of lag, which is awesome. But let's check the other settings and see if that affects it at all. So, uh, I'm going to try to remember what I did here. I have this on mine as well, but the menus are a little confusing. All right, so sharpness, as far as I know, on modern TVs is just an effect. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, and it didn't seem to affect lag really. Dynamic contrast off, super resolution. I basically just turn everything off. Or gamut auto. Out of contra out of curiosity, adding dynamic contrast doubles the lag. So yet another reason to have all of this stuff off. White balance, color management. Now there's a lot more settings we can go into if we're going to be doing some kind of uh, deep calibration. We could go in and, uh, and have it tweaked. I think artings.com posts a lot of these settings uh, that you could just follow the same thing. Uh, sure. Deep color on. Instant game response. So I think that's the setting where it automatically detects if something's in game mode. Uh, FreeSync definitely on for this. We'll want to test that later on as well for the OSSC. Uh, oops, sorry. Additional settings, energy saving. I usually put that off. Funny, if you turn that on, Sometimes it affects lag a little bit, but not always, and it's only a little bit. And I'll just go back in here and double check one last time. Game mode, color tint. Noise reduction off. All of this stuff is off. Perfect. Apply to all inputs. This is something that doesn't always work right. Sometimes you still have to go back in and reapply it, but this should apply to everything. So game mode, let's check the different resolutions. Uh, whenever you switch resolutions on most TVs, it takes a while for the lag to catch back up. So just give it a second when you're doing the measurements. Okay, 480p. Interlace lag isn't terrible, but it's still quite a bit more than progressive. And let's see if it's 240p compatible. 
Uh, it is, but it looks like it's treating it as interlaced based on how much lag is there. Uh, so you're definitely going to want more than that at some point. Now you're going to want to double check those settings every time you change resolutions, as some TVs store those settings per input per resolution. So even if you apply to all inputs like you saw I did before, it might not carry over if you're running a different resolution on that input. And that's a mistake I've made in a bunch of videos that I've made as well, where I'll save all of those settings properly on one input, switch resolutions, and then the aspect ratio will be off or the colors will be off or something. So it's just something to keep in mind and all new TV owners, it's just something that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to notice settings that are weird and off and you're just going to have to keep setting them and eventually you'll get all of the resolutions that you use across all of the different inputs set up. And as for what all of those different things are that I turned off, um, it really depends on the TV and it depends on what manufacturers call them. But for the most part, a lot of those settings are designed to make really crappy TV signals look not as terrible. So for example, a lot of people, even after buying such an amazing TV, will go home and plug in their garbage cable box that their cable company gives them because that's the only choice that they have. And now they have to deal with those horrible signals. So some of those things might actually improve that as well as things like old TV shows or anything with a lot of film grain. However, if you have a really good source, such as a brand new game console or a properly scaled retro console or any Blu-ray or Ultra HD Blu-ray, all of those settings, at least in my opinion, take away from the image. So that's why I always recommend people start by turning all of that off across every input and every resolution. And then if you ever run into an area uh, or any kind of specific scenario where you think, ah, oh, it's, you know, the content doesn't look that good, maybe try turning some of those back on, but definitely never for gaming, only for video and TV signals. And once again, I just, I would always try to start with them off because they do more harm than good in most cases. And I also wanted to test the composite video input for a couple of different reasons, both to see what the lag difference is and also if it processes 240p as 480i. So I'm, I'm using an HDMI to VGA converter and then going through this VGA to composite converter and if you don't believe that these are zero lag, please go check out the other video I did. I don't, uh, don't want to bore everybody else going back through explaining it, but I do have proof to show that this doesn't add anything. Try to lift all this up in one bundle. So 480i over composite video is four times the amount of lag, which is consistent with other TVs I've seen and 240p is still treated as 480i. So we'll double check that later, but overall, uh, as with almost every single brand new TV, you do not want to use its analog video inputs for any kind of gaming. Um, and this one requires all these weird adapters anyway. My LG OLED also has an adapter like this for component video, but that's not supported on this TV, only composite video. For reference, here's the port it plugs into, just a basic 3.5 millimeter jack. Honestly though, it's my strong opinion that if you've just invested a whole bunch of money in an amazing new TV like this, you would never want to go directly into any analog inputs anyway, and especially in a case like this where there's only composite video and not even component video available. So even if you have a large DVD collection with versions that aren't available as Blu-ray or in any better format, you'd still want to at least pick up a decent Blu-ray or DVD player that does some good quality scaling and deinterlacing. And if you have something like a VCR, to be honest, I think those look best on a CRT no matter what, but there are different types of VCRs you could pick up that do basic deinterlacing and HDMI out. And while they're not going to miraculously make them look like DVDs or Blu-rays, it's still better than nothing. And on the gaming side, of course, it's always better to process the signal before your TV hits it so that your TV doesn't mistake the signals, the most specifically the progressive scan 240p signals as if they were interlaced 480i and to reduce the lag. And the best way to do that for any type of input, composite, S-video, component, or RGB, of course, is to put them through some kind of scaler or processor. The RetroTINK products are always an excellent choice, as is the OSSC, which I want to show right now. All right, so I have Super Nintendo running in 480p mode just to make sure that everything's working. And I'm going to go through the different modes uh, because the compatibility goes down the higher up the resolution seems to go on this. 
So 720p works fine. And finally, 5x in generic mode seems to work fine. Um, this is the most incompatible mode, but with something like FreeSync, it should work. But now let's try with optimal timings because that's where I've had the most trouble with my OLED TV. So I'm gonna go in and load, Oop, wrong one, Super Nintendo 256. I already have this set for uh, optimal settings. Everything's tweaked. We're in 5X mode and it looks absolutely perfect and it seems to be working fine. And just to double check and to show once again on all of these TVs that I've seen, whenever you change the resolution of the input, sometimes it asks you to reset all of the settings with it. So this seems to stick, but that's 1080p. So you might have to go back through for all of the other resolutions. Um, but everything seems like it's lining up fine now and it's 100% compatible. And of course I just pressed the wrong button. That's pretty awesome. So this is the best flat panel TV I have ever tested for retro gaming. Nine milliseconds of lag is totally respectable and probably good enough for even the most hardcore gamers, especially considering the lag stayed put at nine milliseconds and never varied. Also, the fact that it's compatible with the OSSC and 5X modes means you don't have to worry about retro gaming content not being compatible with it. You should be able to just put all of your old consoles through a scaler directly into this TV. If you currently own an LCD TV and are looking for an upgrade, any of the new CX models seem to perform just as well as this one. I recently tested another friend's smaller and much cheaper CX, and the lag was identical, so they probably all perform within the same range. Now, if you already own an OLED TV, deciding if you should upgrade would be a lot harder. While this TV is definitely better than my 2016 OLED, it wasn't nearly as big of a difference as when I upgraded from a 1080p plasma to that OLED. I think the lower lag and 120Hz capabilities would probably be the deciding factor, and you should think if those features would justify the cost. At the moment, I still use the 3D feature of my 2016 TV more than I'd use 120Hz, but I'm sure that'll all change within a year or so. Who knows, maybe I'll end up with one of these sooner rather than later. Well, that's it for this time. If you liked this video, please consider signing up for any of my support services, as it's your contribution that's keeping this channel going. Also, check out the weekly podcast that keeps you in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.